Um, I'm going to say hello. I'm, I'm sitting in the garden classroom office here on Newington Green and um, my friend Lucy Markson, who is the head teacher of St Matthias, is also presenting with me today. So I'll let Lucy say hello before I start the presentation. Hi everybody. <laughs> okay. Um, Sorry Lucy, go. No, I was just going to introduce, I've, you've already done it, but I'm the head teacher at St Matthias Primary School, um, which is in Hackney. Fantastic. Okay, now in order for my internet to work, I'm going to have to turn the camera off in order to share a PowerPoint with you. So bear with me while I say goodbye visually and then uh, do a share screen. And hopefully you should be able to see uh, the presentation. So Lucy, is that visible yet? Yep, you're up. Fantastic. Okay, so um, I work for a charity called The Garden Classroom. I'm education and community manager for them and Lucy and I will be presenting together because we're going to talk about a project that we shared together. That was my phone pinging. Goodbye phone, you're going on silent while we do this. I hope everybody else has done the same. Um, here we go. So you should be able to see in front of you um, photographs of some of the different aspects of what we deliver. Is that visible, Lucy? Yeah, is that okay, fantastic. So, um, here you can see the TGC, the Garden Classroom, we offer curriculum linked line sessions and line I'm sure everyone watching knows is learning in natural environment sessions for schools in parks and gardens in and around Islington. We also offer unique outdoor learning experiences. We've got a bee education center. We've got immersive countryside experiences in Kent. We do residential camping. We've got urban forest school courses and we do training and CPD for adults that we've just launched a new training center for in February 2020. So I'm going to show you another photograph of some children exploring outdoors, which hopefully you can now see. I know there's a slight delay on this. We're part of a growing movement which recognises that nature deficit is a real problem and we want to change it. In 2016, The Guardian reported that three quarters of UK children, and again, most people watching this will know, but if you don't know, it's a startling statistic. Three quarters of UK children spend less time outdoors than prison inmates. So time spent playing in parks, woods and fields has shrunk dramatically due to lack of green spaces, digital tech, and parents' fears. All of those things have contributed towards a deficiency. So, um, there's a quote here that I love. It's from Lucy Hellier, who's from the Wildfowl and Wetlands Trust. And this is her, her take on this. Young kids that learn and play outside get direct experience of weather and the seasons and wildlife, things that are only possible outdoors. And they get to assess risks, solve problems and develop creativity. The benefits may seem obvious, but in reality, many children don't get to be outdoors in a natural environment in any regular or meaningful way. And that's even more common among kids from deprived areas. Hence our need to provide this kind of education for urban children. So I'm hoping that you can see a quote from George Monbiot. I never know how to say his name, Monbiot. Um, which is outdoor learning could be the best means of getting children back to school as it permits physical distancing. It lends itself to re-engagement with the living world. And hopefully underneath there, you can see some photographs of children enjoying nature. And we've deliberately chosen slightly more distancey type shots, even though the general rule is that children are quite tactile when they get outside. So I'm going to hand over to um, Lucy now, because she's going to talk to you a little bit about why she got in touch with us. Okay, so um, Siri's put some photographs up here of a, um, what is actually quite a small patch. Now we at, um, at St Matthias School, um, I don't know if you can see on the right hand side of Siri's screen where um, at St Matthias School is. Um, it's actually very, very urban as a space. Um, <clears throat> it's quite a big playground. 
um, but very concrete. And we didn't actually have any access to green space at all. Um, we are right next to a church. So we're a Church of England school. We're connected to St. Matthias Church. Um, but actually, when we re went into lockdown initially, um, and we were talking about returning from lockdown, we needed to um, essentially have more space because if we wanted to have children coming in through different entrances of the school and we wanted to have children separated at playtime, we needed to um, have some more space. So we went to the local vicar who was next door, local, right next door, um, and he has given us access to the whole of his church grounds and his vicarage gardens, um, which gives us direct access through a gate into the space. Um, and what that then opened up is a dialogue around how we could really make the most of having this space because you'll, I'm sure you'll see another picture. There's a huge meadow as well that <clears throat> we've called it a meadow, a huge garden essentially, um, that we can also access. Um, so we approached the garden classroom and said, we've got this huge space that we've acquired, but we don't actually know what to do with it and we don't know how to use it properly. And we really, really want our children to have the opportunity to be outside as much as possible. Um, now we know, that the majority of our children, so St Matthias School um, is, in, is um, based within Hackney. We've got one of the highest levels of free school meals in our school and um, a really, really high deprivation. A lot of our children in our schools have little or no access to outdoor space um, or safe outdoor space. Um, and <clears throat> through the whole duration of lockdown, they weren't actually accessing the space at all. Um, <clears throat> Interestingly, our children were on ITV News the other week on an um, a article about um, the, the impact of COVID. And one of our little boys in year one, the question, what did you miss most about lockdown? And he said, I miss the sun. And the fact that so many of our children didn't actually go outside uh, during lockdown. Bringing them back and bringing them outside allowed them to be outdoors and it allowed them to be safe because obviously we know transmission is lower, especially in a very urban area like Hackney. We know that getting them outside is a lot safer. Um, and also we know that vitamin D, we wanted our children to have as much exposure to vitamin D. So that was our initial thoughts. Um, but again, we didn't know how best to use the space. So that's why we approached the garden classroom for their help. So okay. is that enough of a... That's I mean, lovely. Yeah. Just say a little bit about these pictures, Lucy, because I found this so moving, what you, what you did here. Tell, tell okay, people. So, so, pra so in these pictures here, you can see the start of a, a vegetable patch, essentially. Um, this was lawn. You can see uh, in the picture below where the grass stretches. That's the church path. And the grass had continued. So this whole section was grass. Um, and we've got um, a wonderful teaching assistant in the school um, called Miss Henry, who saw this as an opportunity to do some planting and growing with the children. And she approached Father David and said, um, maybe could I dig a little bed or put a little planter against this wall? And he said, yes, of course, go for it. And before we knew it, she dug the whole of this section <laughs> up into a vegetable patch. Um, <laughs> and Father David came and he saw it and he said, um, oh my goodness, what have we done? And she said, well, it's too late now. And what's amazing is we had the children, in addition to the work that we did with the, with the garden classroom, we also sent all the children out in groups for two hours a week to do gardening. And I don't know, Siri, if you've got a, a later picture any further along. Sadly, but it didn't get that in time, but uh, no, we haven't got a later picture, but it really is looking this is very good. This, this is a good five or six weeks ago. So this is completely full. We've got courgettes, we've got tomatoes, we've got beans. And it's just been amazing because the children, having never ever planted anything before, they didn't want to get their hands dirty in the soil. They were all desperate to get out into the, into the garden. So here you've got a picture of publicity that Lucy got um, by reaching out into the into the church grounds and you can see here that the Hackney Gazette has um, an article to it on the screen so that if you want to read more about that you can when you um, download the PowerPoint you can you can connect to that article. Um, okay so I'll just move through to the beginning of this process. This was all linked, these, these outdoor learning sessions are linked to the idea of the theory of change, improving life chances and the quality of life from nature connection for disadvantaged primary school pupils. That's what this is all about. That is the overarching aim of the theory of change. Now I've put a diagram here that I won't go into too much depth 
on because I suspect that most people watching this will already have a familiarity with this model. But I'm leaving it there so that it's on the PowerPoint for anybody who wants to refer back and see how the outcome would be improved quality of life and improved chances in life for children. That is the aim, the long-term outcome of the theory of change. So, um, in terms of uh, Lucy and I, it started with a phone call. Lucy just gave me a call. She had my number from years before because uh, we, we were friends long ago. Um, and this is an extract from the email correspondence building up to the project. I said to Lucy, it's been suggested by the London Borough education department that we need to check that we're legally allowed to deliver. And the reason I've been treated are hampered by restrictions around using outdoor space. We certainly were and we had to be incredibly careful following risk assessments and guidelines specifically um, COVID related and we had um, Islington's Education School Improvement and Service Department looking at the um, risk assessments in fine fine detail. However we were able to go ahead and deliver even though the rest of Islington was not able to because we were using the vicarage because it was um, essentially private land or at least it was closed off to the public we were able to deliver there so essentially we've done this work covered by the St Matthias risk assessment which is why it's been able to go ahead and it's been a wonderful opportunity for us and for the children we proposed to deliver um, you know Lucy and I talked on the phone and negotiated what we wanted the sessions to to be and not setting boundaries when learning outside to empower the teachers to continue to do that when we are not there activities that encourage a collaborative approach to learning lots and lots of games and i'll show some photographs of those later nature connection activities to support mental health and well-being and curriculum link games with a maths focus we didn't want to let go of the the um possibilities for what is called learning in natural environments, the idea of actually extending your knowledge whilst being outdoors, getting the net benefits of being outside, but continuing to make the learning curriculum linked. So here's sort of some examples of resources that I came up with in response to um, an inset day challenge from a school in Hackney. They wanted us to run inset for their school, but what we realized was that they um, had specifically asked that the maths link to the um, term in which the CPD took place, which was the autumn term. Now, if you go out and look for maths training, you'll see all kinds of resources on the internet for spatial awareness and um, yeah, symmetry. And there are lots of things that nature will lend the autumn term. And so what I had to do was take the program of study the curriculum, the national curriculum program of study across the autumn term and look at every single year group and create games that could happen outside so that this school, which was Nightingale Primary School, could use it on Hackney Downs. And so there's a big document that I spent a long time making to ensure that there was something that would link to every aspect of the curriculum. So that's the kind of thing we've been doing with the children at St. Matthias outside. An example of something I made was uh, we used to play bench ball in year six when I was a year six teacher for many years and um, it was a good chance to consolidate math skills. So I've put some examples up there of the kinds of questions that I would ask and the answer would be the number. So the answer for you know, the question that might be answered as three would be let's say 90 divided by 30 or how many litres in 3,000 millilitres. Things that require the children to think, but each child has um, a representation of being a number and then they go and play uh, a, a kind of sporting activity in between two ropes. And you'll see some examples of that in a bit, but that's just to give you an idea of the kinds of resources that I was using as a touchstone when um, planning some of the maths. This here um, in front of you, you should see links to um, some new government guidelines so in response um, to the current situation, there has been um, next steps printed on a green paper that make the um, prioritising mental health and well-being uh, a statutory. So it becomes statutory from September 2020. Most head teachers weren't aware of this 
as quickly as we were because it's our Lucy really quickly um, and Dr Anne Hunt helped with this to make questionnaires up that would help to assess the current state of the children and to see if there was any impact made through the outdoor learning. We're yet to assess that data so we can't include it here, we're in the process of gathering it all back in. So this is the kind of questionnaire that um, the children would be answering. So there were things like, I enjoy learning outdoors, I try new things outdoors. And there were differentiated questionnaires for key stage one and key stage two. Um, there are a few more pages to this questionnaire. So this is just a sample of two pages from a longer questionnaire. You can see this Venn diagram up here that shows how connected children feel to nature at the start of the project and then coming out the other side. So I know that we're sort of running over now already a little bit. So I'm going to just whiz through some of these pictures. When um, Rosie, who um, was the founder of the charity, uh, and together, we looked at this picture on the left. That's what we were essentially looking at was the, this, there's the vicarage and that's the garden around the outside of it. And it didn't have much on offer. There were some lovely trees, but there wasn't quite enough for us to do forest school activities. And so we were looking at how we could use that space. And Rosie very cleverly suggested that we put logs down as a way of giving the children their own personal space. The two logs at the back there are for the teacher or the two facilitators, and that's for the children so that each one of them gets a log. You can see there aren't many, but the bubbles never had more than 15 children in them. And then Lucy, being a highly creative person, ran out and bought this incredible bell tent, which was, um, a festival bell tent that used to be an art bell tent it came with all kinds of resources so that is now a breakout zone if there's poor weather or if she wants to do outdoor learning ongoing she's got the like an outdoor classroom essentially and luckily father david who is always so generous was just delighted with the look of it he's probably going to use it himself he's very happy to have that bell tent out the back there and this is the children out there using that space. And you can see they really are able to position themselves in an ideal way to focus on the session. They're not focused on the church behind them. It brings us together. And of course, there's the need for different listening signals when you're outside and there's Lucy in the corner as well. We're all doing the silent signal. We can't compete with the children's noise outside. So we, we need to make sure that we have good listening signals. And here's, um, the view that we have when we're facilitating we are held by the church it feels like the impact of the scale of that church and the surrounding environment dwarfs you and protects you and makes you feel somehow smaller and less significant but there is something very um calming about that and i felt like that had a, a, an effect on the children over time as well being in that space um, it's interesting that most people believe that taking children outside will make them more chaotic and harder to control. But the opposite happens when you have that big open space, children tend to come toward you more. And that certainly was what happened in this case. So we've got a, the children here starting to take ownership of the space through some special games that we play. This one is the equivalent of grandmother's footsteps, this little girl here who's just a brilliant kid. <laughs> And here are the children running free in the space outside, something they would never normally be able to do without fear of injury in a playground. And this is um, giving a sense that even when you're doing your learning, the children are physically relaxed and the lack of physical constraint is a very good receptive place to be for learning. I mean, it would be even more the case if they're real, teachers that they have day to day we using this space effectively it would be even more the case that you could push the frontiers of the learning outside very very effectively and this is the game that i showed you the photocopy of the um the resource that goes with it but essentially they're going to run around the outside and they've answered a maths question they've talked about what the answer is we might even have modeled something on a whiteboard to demonstrate it and then they play their number is then called and they play and you can explore some big questions like the difference between a digit and a number and use the space to um, position children to be representative of place value and have discussions about that. We also did some literacy games. We did a word creation game against the clock where children were working on creating words at the same time. 
and uh, making sure that they're aware that the reader can read what they're doing. And this is when I asked the children, look, guys, you know, do you even know your ABC? It was like a joke. And this was their reaction. <laughs> so that's the children of St. Matthias, the year sixes. So, okay, so here we go. So the, the outdoor environment, as you can see, we were very lucky with the weather, but it just creates a softer, more playful dynamic between adults and children. You can see that that's Kat, our volunteer, and she's um, able to be almost one of the children outside. I think there's much more of a them and us dynamic in a classroom when 30 eyes are facing in one direction and one person has to hold the focus for the whole day. It's exhausting for teachers. So we, once we were more used to being outside and we'd created boundaries, set up the boundaries and discussed them and done some uh, circle time games and just got used to being there we were able to do some of the gentler activities some of the um what you might call forest bathing style activities or forest urban forest school activities and here they are cloud gazing not necessarily distancing but we've talked about the fact that children in those bubbles don't really distance from each other we also did some um, activities where we would walk around barefoot and if you walk in shoes there's a thunderous vibration under your feet. You can, it just sounds so loud. As soon as your shoes come off and you start to notice that you walk with your toes more, it softens and quietens down. And you can see how we're much more in harmony with nature when we're not wearing shoes. We did things like picking up sticks with our toes and getting the children used to an initial squeamishness around mud and dirt. And the idea that what's natural is not nasty. Barefoot running, so you could do something that has a competitive element with handicap that stops it being so um, boisterous. So it was quite quite good fun just doing some competitive sports, but barefoot. And here's another um, example of organised chaos. You could not do this inside in this as effectively. And here they are playing a game that has very clear rules, but you can't necessarily see that. Okay, so that's um, one of the circle time games that we played. And then we've got a, an amazing team of freelancers. So there were moments where we could, I couldn't do it all. So I needed to call upon someone. And this is Raya, who's a superb facilitator who came in and did a day with the children as well. So we were able to share the load a little bit there. And then towards the end of the, um, the last day, in fact, I think it was, we had Tom Oldham, who's a very well-known photographer, come in through, um, through Kay Richardson, who's our CEO, they're, they're friends. And he came in because he'd had cancellations due to COVID and was free to come in and photograph one of the sessions. And you'll notice a marked improvement in the quality of the pictures from this point forward, because he's done some beautiful high resolution shots of the children. Can we see that, Lucy? Is that a boy? Is that one of the shots? Are they coming? And then one of the word creation games, but you can just see he just catches it so much better than we, we had. And this is Raya chatting to one of the girls in the current boy year group. And there, there's Tom's input. You can just see them enjoying being outdoors. And at the end, we made them fill in a, a survey. So they filled in one at the beginning, one at the end, and we're going to collate that data and make something of it at a later stage. And that's, that's me done. Thank you very much, Siri and Lucy. Thank you. We've had such um, technical difficulties. I only dropped out just critically at the right, at the wrong moment, just for just for a minute or two. Um, Siri, we we had real issues hearing you throughout. It was coming and going a little bit, so I apologise for that. It's just the way things are. No, 
Um, I haven't picked up any questions on the chat um, unless they appeared while I was out. Um, so can I open it up? Are there questions that people would particularly like to ask? There we go, there's one from Adby. How was the programme funded? Um, so we paid for it as a school. Um, we paid for it from our, um, well, effectively from our budget. So we knew coming back from, uh, from lockdown, we looked across at our kind of staffing um, for the term and um, we knew that we wanted to encourage outdoor learning and um, essentially we we had um we had had a supply teacher who had been coming in on a day-to-day -day basis um who had chosen not to return back into school post um lockdown she was doing one day a week of ppa cover and she chose not to um return so we had some money in our budget that we would otherwise have spent on that member of staff um so what we chose to do is to allocate that funding um, that we had or that money that we'd set aside in the budget to pay for the garden classroom. So when we approached the garden classroom, we effectively said, this is what day rate we would have been paying that teacher. Is that something that the garden classroom can offer us? And because we we came to an agreement essentially around how much we had to spend and whether that was possible. Um, in terms of the, the opportunity was amazing. We pay for it as a school. Um, moving forwards, we don't actually have any money in our budget at all to be able to pay for this um, opportunity. Um, in the return from September, but we don't want to lose it. So what we've actually done is we've put a proposal forward and we've gone out to um, different organisations um, to fund it. So there's a local charity that we put a proposal into to see if they are prepared to um, donate some of their funding uh, towards us as a school so that we can continue that relationship. Um, okay, and just in relation to that, correct me if I'm wrong, Emily, but I think other schools are also using um, their sort of almost like their recovery pot, if you like, their funding. So they're actually are choosing to use their um, their emergency funding, if you like, for, for we, this, certainly we, in other areas. We are doing um, what's known as wellness and recovery days, which are specifically um, targeted towards helping schools out of lockdown. And so Lucy and I are in discussion. Uh, we're going to have a chat after this conference, actually, about putting some of those days in the diary for next year. And it's a way for teachers to have those conversations with children um, post lockdown, some of the ones that wouldn't have been in school. Um, and those are the ones often that are um, potentially have had a more traumatic lockdown. And so it's a way for facilitating private conversations to happen in a lovely outdoor setting while all of the rest of the class are busy engaged in nature themed craft activities and games. So it's a, a kind of treat for the children, but it's also an opportunity for the teachers. And that's something that we're aware is the most, it's the most in demand thing that we're doing after lockdown because most people aren't doing trips. So uh, we're either going to schools and, not, and doing um, sessions in their local park within walking distance of the school, or we're doing wellness and recovery days. And then the link to that, there's a question for Lucy as to the benefits. I know we haven't done the evaluation forms yet, but what, you know, what are the benefits that you're seeing? Um, so, the, I mean, we've seen a huge impact essentially um, with the children. Um, the, the, the initial one was a really kind of obvious one. A lot of our children, were the, the, when we first said to them they were going outdoors, so they were either going to do gardening or they were going to join the garden classroom out on the meadow. Um, they didn't like the idea of it. They said it was dirty. They said they were scared of bugs. Um, they said it was cold, even though it wasn't, the weather was beautiful. <laughs> um, but they had lots of kind of size and they just weren't really up for it. And I, I think essentially it was, there was a level of anxiety attached to it because they weren't used to it, they weren't familiar with it. Um, and as of the last couple of weeks, they couldn't wait. They were chomping at the bit to get outside. So it was really tangible in terms of how excited they were to be outside. Um, one of the year fives came to me last week and she said, Mrs. Bullock, please, please, can I um, carry on doing my learning outside next year? I know I'm going to be in year six, but please, can I carry on with my learning outside? And I said, well, tell, tell me a bit about that. Why, why do you say that? And she said, I think I'm just a nicer person. She said... Um, I used to really annoy the friends in my class and 
now they like me a lot more and I think it's because when I'm out outside I'm more relaxed and I'm happier um, and that's what I want from next year and it was really insightful and actually she's right she, she's a very bright girl and she she knows how to wind up her classmates and she does do it um, and she also winds up her teacher and um, moving her into kind of that outside setting has really really liberated her and she's really really come into her own um, and that was a really insightful kind of comment from her in terms of as a whole school the impact as Siri said she's got the questionnaires and she's going to do a kind of impact assessment of it but I know the children um, really enjoyed it um, and they were, they were really positive about it. I also know just as staff kind of witnessing the impact was really significant. So Siri mentioned the barefoot running, which never actually even occurred to me, but there were eight, nine, 10 year olds who had never taken their shoes and socks off and run on grass. And that was really quite upsetting, but really quite amazing um, to see the impact of that because they, they had to watch an adult do it. They had to watch a couple of brave peers do it first. But as soon as they did it, they absolutely loved it. Um, but I'm not sure how they've got to the end of their primary school and never had that opportunity. And that I think for us as staff has been really um, interesting because it's something we would never have considered before and something that we've really, really noticed and seen the joy on their faces, I suppose, has been the biggest impact. I'm going to pick up the next couple of questions. They've both come in from Rupi actually. One is about nature connectedness, which we're actually, I work with Miles and, and that's why we put the nature connection questions into the garden classroom questionnaire. So absolutely connectedness to nature is different to contact with nature. And it's that connectedness to nature that's linked to wellbeing and pro-environmental behavior. So it's a really interesting um, way to, 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 to pitch this. So it's a scientific way of saying, actually, yes, nature connectedness is something you can do. It's something you can measure and it is linked to wellbeing. So, the two are linked. Um, the other thing is this um, opportunity to use local parks. I'm going to come back to Siri as well, but just to mention that some of our other um, webinars have been about, obviously this, this particular one was in a, a private space, but there are lots of schools that are working because they don't have that opportunity in local parks. So certainly Rotherham are, so they're involving their Rangers team. Uh, Colchester, one of our examples that we had last week, they're using their local park. So they've been begun to address all those issues about how do you move into those spaces with other people as well. I'm going to hand back to Siri because I know you do loads of wonderful stuff with Islington and their, and their parks team too. Yeah, we've got a very wonderful relationship with Islington Council. We work very closely with them. We, were recent, we recently had a meeting with Islington Council where they said to us that we didn't need to fill in the painstaking event apps that we were filling in beforehand. They said it was more administration for them and, um, and it was uh, actually quite time consuming for us. They said, what we're going to agree with you is that you will have priority use of, of Islington parks. We've been helping them to encourage schools to use those parks and they really want the parks used for, by schools, by children, by families, and to make sure that um, they're being used properly. So we, we're very much working um, in tandem with them to encourage that. And, um, and really, the thing is, Islington is a very particularly interesting example because there's the lowest amount of green space per capita in the country, or at least it's up there with, with two, you know, two of them. But it's, it's got so um, little green space. We think of it as being uh, quite green because we've got the heath nearby, but that's Camden. Um, but actually, it's a very densely populated borough with very little green space. So... Um, so yes, so we, we do lots of, uh, we do everything we can to encourage schools to use their local green space. We usually use King Henry's Walk Gardens. So we have a beautiful walled garden where we do a lot of our outdoor learning, but increasingly schools won't be able to travel. So we are adapting our main education sessions to local spaces to the schools so that they can we can do, help them with a walking bus to get there deliver science literacy sessions probably less food sessions because we've got a pizza oven and all kinds of facilities at king henry's walk garden that we won't have next to them in their own local parks but apart from the food we'll do and we've also done a whole um load of uh, uh, curriculum linked sessions to link with a particular school moreland school approached us with their their cross-curricular map and said can you give us more in this area and so we've created all kinds of curriculum content linked to what their 
doing and that's been really exciting because it's meant we've branched out into a whole bunch of new sessions so yeah we're, we're hopefully going to be able to use um, parks and gardens from September at the moment that's what we've been told we are allowed to do okay I suppose the lesson there is where it's working is where the, uh, the providers are challenging the local authority effectively and getting the education teams to work with parks teams and pulling on those examples of where it's already happening to show that it can be done um, yeah. because I know you had to cross a lot of those boundaries when you started so that's what we'd be recommending is that you have those conversations now there's something here uh, two questions for Lucy I would say on how schools are managing the risk of external providers coming to schools mm -hmm. Um, and do they have to keep social distance or as part of the bubbles? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when we first approached the garden classroom, we had a really, really, I mean, we still do have a really, really um, strict and quite kind of structured risk assessment that's in place that has been looked at both by the unions and by the local authorities. So we were, we were confident that what we put in place in terms of our risk assessment within the school was really robust. Um, obviously nothing is um, completely fail safe, but we've done absolutely everything we can to mitigate as much risk as possible. Um, we um, didn't have any intention of bringing any outside visitors in at all when we initially wrote our risk assessment. And actually what was interesting is that we had said, this comes back to what I was saying at the beginning, I, we, had, we knew that outdoor learning was what was going to be best for our children and lots of the advice be it from the unions or be it from you know the dfe they were saying take learning outdoors that's the safest thing to do and i said to my teachers when we returned i said okay everybody um on this lot this lot and this lot i'd like you to take the learning outdoors and this is not kind of meant to reflect badly on the staff at all but i watched staff literally take the learning outdoors so they pick up their maths books and they'd walk out into the playground, they'd all sit down in a circle and they would do their maths into their maths books sitting in the circle outside. So they literally took the learning directly from the classroom outside. And it made me realize straight away that I was putting a massive ask on my teachers because if they didn't have the skills to be learning outside, all they were doing was taking the learning from in the room and removing the four walls, which yes, reduced transmission, but didn't really maximize on the opportunities that we had within the space. Um, and they really needed a significant level of kind of CPD and input into terms of how to do what Siri was describing so effectively, how to translate the learning into, you know, something that is, within the um, natural environment. Um, so that's where we again made an assessment and said actually in terms of impact on learning but also on well-being we need somebody who knows what they're doing to deliver on this um, so that's why we turned to the garden classroom. So within that we then had to review what we had in our risk assessment. Now what we decided is that we were going to be able to have external providers coming into school during COVID um, if they were to only be outdoors. So Siri and Kat who was the volunteer didn't actually come indoors at any point at all and no external visitors were allowed in any classrooms with any children um, because that reduced the risk of kind of surfaces being touched but it also I mean, it protected the children, but also protected the providers. I didn't want visitors coming in and then being put at risk themselves. So the only thing we did do is have a separate toilet that we allocated. So there was a loo specifically for the garden classroom that was used by them, which they could use. But beyond that, everything had to take place outdoors. Um, in terms of, and that's how we managed that side of things. We said that they were outdoors at all times, and that's how we could allow them to work across groups because they weren't actually moving classroom to classroom. The children were coming to them. Um, in terms of how that worked, we then said that the only kind of remit that sat within that is that the external providers coming in had to at all times maintain social distancing from the children. So we sent out our staff, our teachers or our teaching assistants with the children so that if they needed to get up close to the children, if they needed to, you know, if they needed to approach the children, whether it be for first aid or whether it be to kind of support them with their learning, whatever it might be, that it was always our member of staff that would approach that child rather than the external provider. So the remit was external providers, social distance, stayed up outside at all times, and our children kind of came to them. They didn't actually distance between each other. So as much as we encouraged social distancing between our children, we didn't enforce social distancing between our children. Um, and that was the line we took. And we knew that because they were operating in bubbles, um, that was kind of the um, 
the, the kind of boundaries we were working in. So we would encourage the distancing, but we didn't enforce it. But we did make sure that when the garden classroom were working with the children, they maintained their distance from the children. Um, I don't know if that answers that question about the um, bubbles and the social distancing, but that's how we, I don't want to say how we got around it because we, it was a really, really measured kind of decision we made around the risk. We weren't trying to evade anything. We were just trying to work within the parameters that we had um, and it worked really well. The only challenge was if it had rained, we wouldn't have really known what to do because the, our facilitators wouldn't have been able to go in the classroom no, but what we did do is we brought umbrellas with us so that we could put the children into the bell tent, which we did have to do at one point. So they yeah. all went into the bell tent. We pulled open the curtains. We had umbrellas. And Kat and I, who weren't distancing from each other, were able to be quite huddled together and address the children within the tent and send instructions through to the adults who then responded. So it, was, it worked fine. It's absolutely lovely. And we don't even go into the building to register when we're there. We literally go straight round to the gardens and the resources are brought there for us. So it's quite straightforward, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And what you've uh, said, Lucy, reflects again what we're finding with other providers where they're working with schools to mirror that, that individual school's risk assessment and quite often not having any contact with the children at all. So things that they would normally have done, like handing out resources, they, they, the providers don't do that anymore. The teaching staff do that. Mm -hmm. um, what else have we got? Oh, yes, David has quite rightly flagged up to important to remember that not many teachers will have had CPD and this and this is why we're trying to do that brokering of bringing together the schools with the, the people who do have experience in doing this and pointing them to quality assured people and resources that can help schools do this and this is an example of that happening in practice. Um, so another one from Rupi for Lucy, what proposals will you be developing for autumn winter when the weather is unpredictable? So yeah I suppose that's expanding on the tent idea isn't it? Um, so this is this is probably the the wrong answer because I I know for a fact that there's no such thing as bad weather they're just the bad clothing, um, but we're actually going into hibernation over the winter months. So what we've done is we're brokering the garden classroom up until when it gets into kind of deepest darkest winter. We're then going to be going into hibernation, um, so we won't have the garden classroom coming to us, but we will still have use of the outdoor space. So teachers will then have to use kind of their learning their CPD what they've seen the garden classroom do to take the children outside when the weather is well not more predictable but when you know if there are windows within the weather they can take it out obviously with the garden classroom we have a set day so we don't want to run the risk of having them in for a day and then that whole day be wiped out by a storm for example um so what we've done is we've kind of taken a, a break a winter break from the garden classroom where it then will be on the teachers um, or the adults across the school to use the space based on what they've seen at the beginning of the autumn term yeah, so Lisa's um, going to lay on, a, ideally lay on a wellness and recovery days for the teachers immediately coming back from, from uh, the summer holidays. But then after that point, we take a break and then we come back in later, as, as, as you say. Yeah, so February we would, we would then return and then we'd have the learning every single week from February through to the um, end of the academic year. Um, another thing that we're doing at the moment is we're just putting a bid together um for um outdoor clothing um i think it might only stretch to enough wellies per child um if that is what we need um but we know to, in order to get the appropriate kit it is really a really quite significant cost um so we're going to do what we can the the ideal scenario would be that we'd buy one set of waterproofs and wellies for older children and one set for younger children but given covid that is something we're not actually able to do children would have to have their own wellies and their own waterproofs we can't be sharing clothes so that really is the only kind of limiting factor in all of this unless we had enough funding to buy enough outdoor clothing for every single child um, and at this stage we don't um, but we are going to do what we can to get some clothing in order that we don't miss out altogether on being outside. I'm just wondering if things like that, things like that we could think about if we could get a sort of a big deal somehow, because that's on our list for how we might help schools. So, you know, practicalities with, with things like kit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, and just for, from me, Lucy, is there any, are you planning to go further afield with your outdoor learning? Are you, are you, now that you've got that space next to your school, will you think about like sort of the wildlife trust are saying, we've got loads of other sites as well. There's a, are there, there are other sites potentially that you could be going to? We would absolutely love to. And if we weren't bound by COVID, 
we would be off essentially. Um, we know we've got Epping Forest on our doorstep so we can get onto the, um, the train line just up the road and be in Epping Forest in very little time. We know that the garden classroom have a site down in Kent that we could go and visit. So longer term, that's absolutely the plan because we want to for children to you know, have that opportunity. And as Siri said, the space that we've got is a real luxury, but it doesn't lend itself to forest school at all. Um, so you know, we know how much more there is that they could get from being in other spaces. Um, the problem is, is that we don't want to be taking our children on any form of public transport at all. Um, and the only way to get anywhere um, uh, that would allow us to kind of really experience that kind of connectedness with nature that goes beyond just the vicarage garden uh, is going to involve some kind of transport um even if we were to put on a coach we could only ever put i mean we could take 30 children i suppose somewhere because that's the maximum amount of children that can be in one space together so we could take a class of children somewhere but again our community within the school are very very nervous so hackney has um one of the highest rates of covid nationally um we've got 90 percent of our school population is um black african or black caribbean and we know that the bain community has been really hard hit by covid so in terms of kind of working with our families um getting children outdoors they love the idea of that taking children any further than the school perimeter absolutely not it's hard enough getting them into school in the first place so we you know we've got lots of challenges as a school um, so for now we're going to be keeping it close to home but we know that these relationships open up lots of opportunities for the future and what that may look like so we would love to go further afield but at the moment we are I was going to say restricted we're not restricted because we can we can really use the space but not to the extent that we would like to yeah, yeah, and you've got an offer there from Abby for Woodbury Wetlands. <laughs> if you feel like thank half an hour, walk. thank you, Abby. Good. Yeah, <laughs> and then the other thing is a question to everyone: um, How much time would you like each child to be learning outdoors? Oh, it's to Lucy actually. For how, <laughs> yes, going forward, I suppose. Um, I, I mean, as much as possible. I think it. it this is going to be a really difficult answer to give, but the curriculum is so jam-packed already and it's really it, it's a real battle i suppose to be able to give everything as much airtime as possible because obviously you've got reading writing maths you've got humanities you've got science you've got all the areas of the curriculum so there's a way to be really creative and take the learn the curriculum learning outdoors um, so at the moment, we are looking more at the learning in the natural environment side of things because we can be translating the learning from the classroom outside and then we are not losing time within the timetable, if that makes sense. Um, our only real restrictions and our only real parameters are timetabling. So how to fit it in. Um, so in an ideal world, um, I know that when the garden classroom first approached us, they looked at every single child in the school having half a day of learning outdoors every week, um, which I jumped for joy at and then cried when I looked at my timetabling, because there is absolutely no way as a school we can facilitate half a day a week. Um, they're doing half a day a week for PE, they'd be doing half a day a week outdoors, and then they'd have four days left, which doesn't actually leave enough space to fit everything else in and I think if you speak to any teacher in any school they will tell you that that's always a battle because everything needs everything needs to be covered um, so what we're looking at from September is we've chosen in the first term we're first half term we're giving every class half a day um, so they get kind of as um, Siri said a recovery and well-being day outdoors then we're giving every teacher one lesson on their timetable so that that one lesson can be taken outdoors. So teachers are taking the learning outdoors based on what they've seen and what they've had modeled to them in CPD. And then coming back after March, we've chosen three classes in the school and each class will get two hours a week. So either a morning or an afternoon where they will be outside. Yeah. Um, and that's the we're under a lot of pressure as a school anyway within our local authority because we need to raise standards um, as a lot of schools do and I genuinely believe that by taking learning outdoors we will raise standards um, but we've also got kind of the saps that are very much sitting you know there in the back of everyone's mind so that's our that's our kind of 
brilliant. Okay. Um, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't flag the LATC mark here. So that's a sort of framework for schools that helps them plan, deliver, and then evaluate their learning outside the classroom in a progressive way. So you start where you are, decide where you want to go to, and then build those steps, just as you've articulated. But some of our gold schools, you know, in, in London, are only teach in the classroom half a day, half, half a day every day. So they're in the classroom every day, half till lunchtime, and they're out every every afternoon so it's we've got that whole spectrum of schools on that sort of journey uh, and they're fantastic case studies and they're really uh, uh, willing to talk to other schools about their journey and how they've got there and, and the benefits because um, it is absolutely about how they're delivering their curriculum rather than just being a, also, a also that, just to say regarding uh, to kind of addressing things you've both said regarding curriculum coverage I think a really uh, clever way to address that is to uh, make sure that the focus of those lessons is different in each case so that one of your art lessons in the half term is outside one of your maths lessons in that half term is outside one of your English lessons and no one subject then suffers from a lack of rigor around detail about what goes into books because there's only one lesson missing from that that palette that you're looking at there in terms of a lesson that's delivered outside it may be that there is a different focus for that lesson but no one subject becomes the casualty of the experimentation that's needed in that process. Okay. Um, I mean, yeah. ideally, I would, I, what, um, uh, um, what has been mentioned with the half a day in the classroom and half a day outdoors, I think that would be absolutely incredible. Um, <laughs> again, it's about CPD of staff, so being able to do that. It's about funding, so we would obviously need funding to be able to have providers like the garden classroom deliver on something like that and we'd really really need the confidence as a school to be able to do that mm -hmm. and I think you know over time that's where we would like to be headed but we're very very new to this so it, it would it's you know it would it would not that it would be a risk but I think it would be very at this stage it would be um, too big a step to take to go yeah. straight into a model like that I think we need yeah. to start off small and then see impact prove the difference it's making and then slowly start to grow and develop but for that we've designated as a school leader in the school to be um uh, um she's she's going to be leading on outdoor learning from september and that's a role we've never had in the school so it's also become part of our school development plan so we've built it into our school development plan Brilliant. so this isn't something that's just kind of a flash in the pan this is something that is going to be the future within the school um, but obviously we're just being cautious because we don't want to kind of jump in straight away and then not yeah. know what we're doing essentially you'd be eligible for bronze mark i'm sure lucy already because it's about mm -hmm. that commitment so identifying a key lead and a commitment to inclusion and and building it across your curriculum so um the other thing that uh, obviously we can do is try and do that brokering and point to people that are out there to help. So um, not, it's not only Council Learning Outside the Classroom and our resources, but all the quality badge holders that we've got, you know, they're all out there to help schools with this, either just delivering activities or with their curriculum planning. Um, so yeah, do, do that, that's what we want to try and do is make, make that connection between schools and all those, that plethora of fantastically high, you know, highly qualified people that will help the schools either deliver activities for them or help them build the capacity and skills to do it themselves um, and the outdoor education advisors so there's a whole network of outdoor education advisors out there as well uh, who will work with very closely that will be brilliant at doing that and helping schools go on that journey um, we're running out of time we've got five minutes let's see if they siri will any of the wellness and recovery ideas be available online for teachers to use um it we what we're doing is we've um we received uh, some funding from the Sir John Cass Foundation to deliver um, CPD to schools uh, for free, which we have been doing for the last couple of years. We filled the quota of schools now, but as part of that, we built up, we've coined the term OLCO, Outdoor Learning Coordinator, because we feel that, you know, schools are awash with acronyms and there's a SENCO and there's an ENCO and every, every so we, we feel like co coining a term having that become established within schools as much as possible so for every school that we have worked with we've tried to recruit an OLCO within that school and we are creating an OLCO uh, web page on our website but also OLCO network meetings and that that's not just for schools 
uh, that we've delivered to. It's absolutely not about that. It's about bringing people together to share ideas. We have access to really beautiful outdoor spaces. We love to share them. And it's really, really exciting to see teachers get together and, you know, pop open a bottle of Prosecco perhaps on the very first occasion and maybe a bit more modest cup of tea on further occasions. But we're planning to launch and deliver um, outdoor learning uh, coordinators network meetings ongoing. And we'll do that for free. Um, there's one more. Lucy, what have the parents thought about this approach? Um, in brief. <laughs> in brief. Um, I'd love to say that they'd fully embraced it. I think work is, needs to be done with our parents and with our community. Um, I think very much a lot of our parents within the school have a very traditional view of what learning looks like. In, um, and they see that learning in the classroom is learning and anything outside the classroom is playing. Um, and that is very much the feedback we've got. Not that it's been negative, just that the parents aren't yet um, fully aware of the, the the benefits of taking learning outside so there is a huge amount of work to do within the community around the benefits of learning outside and how that is still as um, has the same level of kind of high expectations and rigor of what would happen in the classroom. Uh, the other piece of work to do with parents is um, we're not talking about mental health. We should be much more, but a lot of our community don't engage particularly strongly when we bring up anything around mental health. So actually entering into it, um, dialogue and discussion around kind of well-being and wellness is, is really important um, for our children and for our community as well. So it, it's a long way to go, um, but it's not going to stop us doing it. We just need to work together to make sure everyone can really see the full benefits of what, we, what we're doing. Thank you, Lucy. Now, look, I'm really sorry, but we're coming up to the end of our time. Um, so if there's any questions we've missed, we'll follow up with them afterwards. We'll send you all the link to the uh, webinar and that will give you the link to all the other webinars as well if you're interested. There'll be a feedback form, so please fill that in. Tell us what you else you'd like to see covered in these sorts of sessions, what we've done well in this time um, or what could have been improved. Uh, and we'll try and deliver the things that you want us to do on these sorts of webinars. So can I really thank our two speakers really inspiring, great ambassadors for what we're doing. Thank you so much for being brave and exploring. Um, and, uh, and thank you everyone for, for taking part and please keep in touch. Thank you.